Good morning, East Bay. What is happening in Alameda, Contra Costa, and Solano counties? Learn about what's happening in our communities, an in-depth conversation, so you know what's going on. We're talking to government, economic, political, nonprofit, and business leaders here in the greater East Bay. I'm Jared Ash, the host of the Capstone Conversation. Welcome to today's episode of the Capstone Conversation. I am your host. Jared Ash, and today we are joined by the great mayor of Antioch in Contra Costa County, uh, Mayor Thorpe. Thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me and delighted to be here. So tell us a little bit about your background. What did you do before you were mayor? Where do you come from? What's your history? Share your story with us. Well, before I was the mayor, I was the council member. And so I was an at-large city council member before we went into districts. And, you know, my professional career is in higher education administration. That's where I spent most of my time. Prior to that, I did do some, I was a third grade teacher and an eighth grade teacher in Washington, D.C. And, and of course, I served in the United States Navy for eight years, five active in and three um, in the reserves. And so, so, you know, that's kind of, that's kind of who I am. I, and then I one day ran for mayor and here I am as the mayor of the greatest city God ever created. And that's the city of Antioch. And if you don't believe me, it's in the Bible. <laughs> Let me just flip to that page and, and <laughs> you there. so tell us more about the city of Antioch, its history, its background, its geography, what makes it unique, what makes it the greatest city? Well, Antioch is actually one of California's oldest cities. And so, and it's Contra Costa's very first city. And so, so we're special in that regard, obviously given the history, just like California's history, uh, Antioch's early history is just, it's, you know, it's ugly. Uh, particularly as it relates to, you know, Asian Americans. We were one of the first cities who had sundown town laws where we made it impossible for, for Chinese people, Chinese immigrants to live here. And, and later on uh, in our history, we, we literally ran the Chinese out by burning, by burning their communities to the ground. And so, and it wasn't a secret. It was, you know, headline news in the, in the, in the Sacramento Bee, you know, the San Francisco Chronicle, all these different newspapers reported on it, not in a way that will look this horrible thing happen. It was like the Caucasian torch came and expelled the Chinese, Chinese who were bringing all these problems. So it was, you know, it was a pretty ugly time for certain people, but it doesn't mean that it wasn't, you know, it was good times for some people. And so we, we have a, we have a 150 year plus, plus history uh, in our city. Uh, and so a lot of culture, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, European diversity. And so uh, up until the 1990s, Antioch was exclusively white. Uh, today, we are the second most racially diverse city in the San Francisco Bay Area, one of the fastest growing in Northern California. Uh, and of course, now the second largest city in Contra Costa County. So we've come a long way in terms of building a, a city that's inclusive and welcoming of all people has not been easy by any stretch of the imagination. And while there have been all, there's always been tensions in terms of uh, particularly racial tensions, it feels like it's all come ahead <laughs> in my last three years as mayor. So it's been it's been fascinating to watch all this and have a front row seat, but not just have a front row seat. In many ways, I'm also kind of the bus driver of all this and, and trying to get people to, to a location that, that makes them feel safe in their community, makes them feel welcome in their community. And it's not easy. It's a, it's a rambunctious bunch of people. <laughs> and I say that in a good way because it, it speaks to our maturation process. There's just different ideas now. And the way business was done in the past isn't the way uh, forward. It, it's got to be in a way that includes everybody. So let's, let's hit on some of the development in Antioch. You guys have a ton of new housing coming up. If you drive, I, I live in Walnut Creek and I've come to Antioch, one of the most beautiful ways you can around through Clayton, around Mount Diablo and through the middle of nowhere and, and farm country. And you come up Deer Hill Road to the backside where the first thing you hit is a Kaiser, beautiful new Kaiser facility in Antioch. And then you see 
from farms and open space, you see housing development after housing development, new housing. If you go to a, and then you have nice single family homes in that area and you go to another part of Antioch and it looks like there's two very diverse Antiochs. Talk about the growth the city is experiencing and how you're taking that in. Well, I always tell people being mayor of Antioch is like being mayor of two cities. As you know, we have two zip codes. One is one of the one of the one of the wealthiest zip codes in eastern Contra Costa County, second to Discovery Bay. Many people think it's Brentwood, but it's not. It's actually in Antioch, and that's the nine four five three one zip code. And then we have another zip code uh, that it's that is in Antioch's more historical and, and older parts. And while at one point it was one of the Poor, one of the poorest zip codes in in the county. It has, interestingly enough, the medium household income has gone up. To my surprise, it, it was it was like in the fifties, or it's now up to like close to eighty thousand dollars in terms of medium household income, which for the Bay Area is is relative to everything is still is still moderate to low. But so it's like being mayor of two, two cities, the, the, the zip code that I talked about earlier, the 94531 is where you have a lot of diversity. You have a lot of new folks who come into the, to the city. You have a, you, it, you know, it, it's this side of town that now decides the elections uh, in Antioch. Uh, it's where the majority of African-Americans live in that part of Antioch. And, and interesting enough, that zip code is also home to the largest concentration of black people in the Bay Area with advanced degrees. And so I always tell people, when you look at my resume and you look at who I am, please don't take that to be an exception of every, anything because that is the norm for, for Antioch. And so it's, it's, it's a privilege to live in, in, a, in a community like that. But at the same time, there's an imbalance, obviously, when it comes to like, you know, income and wealth inequality, it's, it's here. There are people who have lived here for generations, who for generations grew up in a working class community where you can go work at a, at a factory, you can go work at the steel mill. And today, you know, those jobs are relatively gone, particularly after the 1980s. And so there are a lot of folks here who have waited, who have been waiting for change for a long, long time. And so it's, it's just interesting. It's interesting to see all that. Yeah, obviously, infrastructure issues are going to be different in each side of town. We probably invest more in the northern part of town than we do in the southern part of town because because the infrastructure is much older. So we we do our best to ensure that 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 we're being equitable. Uh, there there's a lot of work to do to you know kind of bring some level of, of of continuity within Antioch. As an example, there's a street which is the one street that goes that traverses throughout Antioch. It, it's at one in southeast Antioch. It's called Lone Tree. You get to the northern part of Antioch, it's called A Street, and then you get to the downtown historic district, and it's called Second Street. And at some point, I think we're going to, in order to bring people together in this idea that we're just one Antioch, we're going to have to rename that street. And whether it's Lone Tree, A Street, Second Street, it's got to be one name that traverses throughout our entire city. That city, that street connects our police department, City Hall. It connects our Parks and Recreation Department. It connects our community center up in the southern part. And so it's, it, it can't be a street that's divided because I think it's symbolic of, of kind of the different generations that existed here. That's fascinating. I mean, you see that in, in other areas where a road will, def will cut through multiple cities. I think Ignacio Valley becomes Kirker Pass, becomes, I think, become railroad or, or intersects with railroad down in Pittsburgh. But within one city, it's interesting how you describe just the history of the town and you can see the evolution on that one road. You absolutely can. People who live on, who live uh, around Second Street in downtown, which we call the historic Rivertown district, have a completely different existence and life experience than someone who lives off of A Street. And then obviously, once you get up to Lone Tree, you know, the experiences of people are much, much drastically different than someone who would live off of A Street. And so, and so it's, you know, it's important to note those things, but it's important to also have an understand. It's, it's important to contextualize those experiences, particularly as policymakers, so that you know how to deal with these issues. But it's also important to create unity among the different socioeconomic backgrounds that we have here in the community. 
So easier said than done. What are some policies, social events, things that you're doing to create that that atmosphere you're sort of talking about? Well, you know, I would like to say that I wish, you know, we could just do everything under the sun. But as you know, government, you know, we have a certain set of parameters and it's largely built around the budget and what you have the money to do. And so uh, in terms of the question that you just just asked, I think we have been laser focused on the idea of equity, uh, particularly in our older parts of the community. We recognize as an example that, you know, while we would love the county to fix all of our problems, for whatever reason, you know, we still don't have a homeless shelter in Eastern Contra Costa County. There is no care center in Eastern Contra Costa County. So we decided, you know what, uh, we can't just let people languish on our streets. So we decided to open Master Lisa Hotel, use our own money and start housing people. In addition to that, we recognize that uh, it's one thing to put people in homes, but as we're putting people in, in housing and trying to transition them into permanent housing, we also recognize that, you know, there's another leak on the other side, which is people are losing housing. Uh, and so uh, we decided to do something pretty historic, particularly for Eastern Contra Costa County. And that was to do rent stabilization uh, and then anti-harassment, anti-tenant harassment policy. And we're working on just cause yeah, eviction. And so I think, you know, we try to look at things from, from an equitable lens to ensure that people are, are able to maintain housing because it's, it's, it's different depending on what part of town you're in. So I, you know, your question is, is, is brilliant in terms of under, contextualizing and understanding these challenges. Yeah. And I appreciate you sharing. I want to dive into two things you just said, rent stabilization and just cause eviction. Other cities are looking at it throughout the Bay area and throughout California. What did you ultimately adopt in Antioch? Well, some people might argue, depending on what side of the issue you're on, that we we adopted one of the most progressive policies in California. And then some other people would probably say we adopted a radical anti-landlord policy. Yes. <laughs> depending on who you ask, you can get a different answer. I think we passed a policy that was just for people. Listen, you and I both know that Bay Area cost of living continues to go up and the largest chunk that people pay in, in, in cost after they've worked a hard week to put food on the table is housing. There's just no bones about it, whether you own a home or whether you're renting a home or whether you're renting a studio or, or a whatever, maybe you're renting a, a room, the rel you know, relative to your, to your overall income, housing is taking a large chunk and it continues to go up. It is absolutely ridiculous. I bought my home for $359,000, 3,000 square foot plus home, which I love and, and proud of. But it went from 359 to when I put it on the market, it was going for like a million plus. I've only lived in Antioch 11 years. And in those 11 years, the house has astronomically skyrocketed to my, to my advantage, right? I'm not complaining by any <laughs> stretch of imagination. But where would I be today if I didn't have a house or if I was renting or, you know, I would be able to afford. That's just ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. And so, you know, the economic downturn for some folks was bad. For other people like myself, we were able to take advantage of the opportunity that existed, which is the housing prices had had hit rock bottom. And so I was able to afford a home. But outside of that, how would I ever be able to afford a home in the Bay Area? And by the way, I live, you know, in the uh, in the in the su in the in Bay Area suburbs, I don't live in the inner core of the Bay Area. So, can you imagine what the costs are in you know, in in communities that are closer to the uh, to the job centers? Yeah, we I just recorded an episode with the Realtors Association of Contra Costa and Solano counties, and they said an interesting stat that throughout the Bay Area, only. One in four people, 25% can afford a home. Mm -hmm. And that, and they defined it as not just a single family resident, but any, any resident. And they said, that's a staggeringly low number. But we said that you're still getting multiple offers on most places, especially when interest rates come back down, you'll get even more, which will actually drive prices up further. 
And they just said it's a housing supply issue. There's just not enough here. But it's not good for the overall economy if one out of four people could afford a home. Yeah. I don't know how else to put it. I mean, it's it's just a bad situation. And my and and, and for renters, you know, they're always stuck between a rock and a hard place because they have to provide housing for their families. And then we have examples of of landlords not being too kind. And so our our role was to get all landlords to a level where respectable landlords are. And that is to treat their 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 tenants with uh, with some level of fairness as it relates to rent hikes, and and some level of dignity when it comes to settling or figuring out disputes. Uh, and so most landlords tend to tend to uh, tend to ha- were already abiding by that standard. We just elevated those who were not who weren't. And for decades here in the city of Antioch, and I've gone to these apartment complexes. I visited them, and I was just blown away at the absolute neglect by some of these landlords as it relates to these huge corporate corporate apartment complexes. It was disgusting from mold to just dilapidated parking structures to, to a host of other things. So it, I, I saw a, a, uh, an unfair situation that a lot of people were fine with. And I just personally, myself and other council members were not. And so that's how, that's how it goes. And, and can you, you recall any of the specifics that were in there? What did it touch on? Like, did it cap rent growth at X? Percent? We capped. We capped rent increases at three percent or 60 percent of CPI, whichever is lower. And and so that was that was basically. I mean, at the heart of the matter, that was it. Sure. Okay, that's helpful to understand. Want to pivot and talk about desalinization? You guys have a new plant going in there in Antioch. Is it now operational? It will be later this year. Okay. Talk talk to us about what are you trying to achieve? What's your goal? Educate people about the plant. Global warming is real. Climate change is real. The ice caps are melting. As the ice caps melt, it sends more water down. <laughs> And it, it creates more ocean water coming up the Bay Area, coming into the Delta. And so that makes it, it that makes it difficult for us as a city uh, to pump water. As you know, Antioch is one, because we are one of the oldest cities in California, we have what we call uh, pre-1419 water rights. That means we have superior water rights to most cities in California. And that means we are the, really the only city who gets to pump directly from the Delta. No other city gets to pump from the Delta. We have our own water distribution, collection and distribution plant. Most cities buy, especially in our area, buy their water from the Contra Costa Water District. And so they have their own process in terms of how they get the water. But there's more salt in the water and we need to pump water. And so the water desalination plant or the brackish water desalination plant is is has been is a solution uh, to the challenge of uh, to the real challenge of climate change that's taking place right before our eyes. And but the the desalination plant also allows us to keep water rates low, lower than Contra Costa Water District. And so we're one of the few cities that that if you compare our water rates are much lower than most folks in the Bay Area. Uh, so that's a plus. And so the, the desalination plant will allow us to keep doing that, because if we ever had to switch over to Contra Costa Water District, our, our, our rates are going to go immediately up. That's great. So you guys were able to make a significant financial investment in new infrastructure and yet keep your rates lower than some of the bigger entities. So congratulations on that. Good plus. So let's talk about Antioch on the water. You have access to a deep water port. How does that help and hurt the economy of Antioch? And what's the potential future that that can be taken advantage of there? Well, the potential is already happening right before your eyes. Uh, we have amp ports here now. They're going to be shipping in cars, and so we're they're going to be building a huge facility for 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 the for the offloading of all these vehicles that are become, going to be coming from uh, foreign countries. And so 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 the port is currently working, and it should be later this year or next year where they'll they'll begin construction on the facility. But they already have ships coming in, so. Anybody is welcome to take advantage of that. Does it hurt the economy? It does, certainly doesn't hurt the economy. Does it bring jobs? Absolutely. We're talking about longshoremen jobs. Those are, you know, those are high paying jobs. 
And so anything we can do to spur economic growth in that, in that realm, you know, I'm excited about, so I was excited to vote for that project. Does it come with environmental challenges? Absolutely. And I don't want to sit here and pretend that, you know, ships don't pollute, they do. And so, but, you know, we're all marching towards, towards a new reality of how we, how we, you know, reduce uh, these emissions in our air. We're regulated in terms of how many ships can come in to ensure that the air quality is, is good. So the air quality board has, has, you know, regulated that. And so it's not like it's going to be an endless amount of ships coming into to our port. I think we're limited to about six a year. So we're doing our best to ensure that residents, that we take residents, you know, or the environment into perspective as we're making these decisions. That's great. I didn't realize it was limited to only six ships a year. That's one every other month. That's, so that's not a significant amount that can come. Well, it's a significant amount when the port hasn't been working or hasn't been utilized the way it should be. So whether it's one or six, it's significant to us. And let's not forget that the economic impact starts when those, when those cars are, are, are off the ship uh, and into this facility and then being moved off to different locations. So that means they're using our roads and whatnot. So the, the economic impact is significant uh, for a port that has been idle for, for decades. I have been doing a little bit of research and something to keep in mind is apparently there's a lot of food raw food materials that goes past Antioch and Pittsburgh and on out. And like you can have grain and product for granola, but it goes out elsewhere to be processed. And so might be opportunity. I don't know what the economics are in processing it in this country, but if you could do, if you could look at food processing and capturing ships leaving that are passing uh -huh. by, it might be something to, to look at. And I could put you in touch with a couple of people that know more than, than I do, if you ever want to talk further about it. Sure. Yeah. You know, Antioch is not immune to food manufacturing. We used to have lots of uh, canneries here in the, in Antioch, which is where a lot of our contamination comes from. <laughs> but, but who would have thought, you know, tomato peels would have contaminated the environment, but they do. <laughs> so, so there's, you know, Antioch has had, had a history of manufacturing and, and particularly in, in the food products. So that, that wouldn't be unusual for our area and certainly something worth exploring. I want to pivot to transportation. You sit on the CCTA, Contra Costa the Transit Authority Board, and the, that authority, along with the city of Antioch and I think Oakley and, and maybe Pittsburgh, have a have created a contract for a rail line using smart technology and glideways is, is where I'm talking about. Can you talk a little bit about the glideways program, what it will be offering and what should people know? So, yes, so that's, so it's in partnership with not the cities, but in part, well, kind of with the cities. Yes. Cause it, you know, it's our right of way, but really it's being led through Tri-Delta Transit, our regional transportation authority here, which I happen to be the chair of. And so, so that's, so that's, that's something we're currently exploring. It should be interesting. It's a, you know, it's, it would be a line dedicated, not line like a railroad, but a, a glide way where small vehicles traverse, where you would have, you know, up to like four occupants that will literally take you to certain locations throughout the region to get you to bark faster and much more efficiently than the current process, which is either drive or take Uber or Lyft to try my ride. So. We're always exploring new ways to, to make accessibility to transit much more efficient. And so that's, this is one of those ideas. Great. I appreciate it. I, I want to talk uh, next about city government and some of the changes that are going on there. You have an interim city manager at the time we're recording this, at least an interim deputy city manager. What is the process to find the right fit for the city and move into full positions? Well, we have acting city manager and an acting, Sorry, acting. Uh, city manager. So, you know, I, this speaks to what I was talking about earlier, and that's the maturation process in the city. You know, Antioch was once a quiet city off the Delta. And no one really talked about it. Again, it's one of the fastest growing cities in the Bay Area and in, and in Northern California. Uh, who is coming here? you know, is going to shape the politics uh, of what's happening. Uh, and, you know, we have a lot of folks who now come from cities like San Francisco, Oakland, where the role of the mayor is much different than what it is here. 
And so the expectations of what people think I can and can't do, you know, can be somewhat unreasonable. And, and even in cities where like San Francisco or Oakland, where, where you have like strong mayor positions, there's still a professional at the helm in the form of a city manager, a city administrator who are taking care of these, some of these issues. So now we're in the process of trying to find the right city manager who makes good sense for, for our city, who kind of recognizes the changes that are taking place, not resisting the changes, who has kind of a better feel for the different demographics of our city and, and has a better understanding, particularly around what public safety means. And that public safety doesn't just mean, you know, a police on every corner. It means investing in, in sheltering people. It means investing in youth programmings. It means investing in gun violence intervention programs that work in the community. And, and so that is, that's something that we're, that, that we're looking for. And have we been able to find that in recent years? It's been, it's been challenging because, uh, again, Antioch's going through a maturation process. It's like watching a teenage kid in middle school look at themselves in the mirror with a bunch of pimples and they're now smelling like BO and it, they're coming to grips with some new emotions and whatnot. And that's Antioch at the end of the day. We're, we're, we're a growing city. We're maturing into something. Do we know what that is yet? I'm not precisely sure, but we are in the maturation process and that's going to come with a little, with some heartache and, 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 and some turnover in terms of getting folks to understand what's happening. That was a very descriptive analogy, probably of your own high school image in the mirror there, right? <laughs> when I looked in the mirror, I looked just fine. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. He just came from a, a roast the other day. So we were just continuing uh, to give him a hard time here. So we can't talk about Antioch and not talk about the police issues there. I just, what I want to talk about today is frame the issue, but let's talk about how you're moving forward in the city versus talking about the past. But if you could frame the issue and then let's talk about what are some of the ways to solve that, that would be great. Frame the issue. Well, I mean, I'm not going to frame anything. I'm just going to give you the facts. The facts are yeah. we have a, like 11 officers that were that were indicted by federal government. Several other se several others by the by were charged with with state crimes by the DA's office, and then over 40 were implicated in in a racist text messaging scandal. Uh, so as a result of that, we now have uh, two state investigations of the Antioch Police Department. We have an unbelievable amount of lawsuits that we're in the middle of. Uh, trying to, you know, sort through. So as a result of that, we, you know, we're authorized 115 police officers. Currently, we have about 40 something working on our streets right now for a city of 120 plus thousand people. So that is, those are the facts. Yep. Those are the facts. The indictments, a lot of them have to do with civil rights violations and then other types of crimes. And then the attorney general's investigation, attorney general Bonta's investigation has to do with patterns and practices, obviously around racial bias. And so there's, there's a lot that we're looking at. And then the city council approved my three audits related to hiring practices, internal affairs, and, and, and also patterns and practices of like a, a racial equity audit within the police department. So there's a lot, there's a lot going on. So as a result of that, we have started rebuilding. Let me tell you that before all this happened, we had already proposed for police reform. We had done some critical work around police reform, particularly given the backdrop of George Floyd in 2020. So one of my first initiatives was to stop the hiring practice of individuals who are under investigation and coming to the Antioch Police Department. So that no longer happens. That's done and over with. We stopped the use of certain techniques that can cause positional asphyxiation. We instituted a, 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 a police oversight accountability board, which I'll be inaugurating next, oh, this beginning um, this month in February. So soon we'll have a celebration for that. I can go on and rattle off all the reforms that we did early on that I think helped us in navigating the challenges that we're navigating today. So how are we rebuilding? Uh, we're in the process of, of, of doing that. Some people will yell and scream at the top of their lungs. We need to rebuild. We need to re We're in the process of it. Relax. The, the, since 
since the announcement of the FBI investigation, I early on said we need to do a hiring incentives. Uh, I had asked for 40,000 uh, bonus for, for new officers. The council approved $30,000 bonuses. Since those bonuses were approved, we've hired 14 new officers straight out of the academy. And by the way, we're hiring straight out of the academy because of our policy that we passed before all of this happened. So, you know, some laterals can come, but you can't be under investigation, period. And so as a result, all of our new candidates have been from the academy. That is great news because it's been no secret what's been happening. So that means the people that we're getting, I don't think they're coming here because of the incentive. I think the incentive created a pool. I think the people who chose to come here have been folks who have seen what's happened and said, you know what, I'm willing to take a chance with Antioch because there's good changes taking place there. And I want to be part of that policing. So I'm excited about that. Um, we also got to hire a new chief of police. So we're in the process of doing that. I had called for the direct appointment being from the city council because my frustration over city managers over the years and their inability to oversee the police department and have and, and, and hold the chief accountable uh, was very frustrating. But but so that didn't happen. So now we're when we hire a new city manager, they will be able to appoint a new chief of police. So there's a host of things. We also have the public safety partnership with the federal government that uh, that we're in the process of uh, continuing to navigate. So that brings us additional resources. One of the good things that we had done, and I mean good things that we had done, is our uh, and we didn't know this was going to happen, but it all happened at the right time. So the Office of Neighborhood Safety in Richmond is something we try to model here in Antioch. Uh, ours is a little more, it goes beyond just the gun violence inter interruption stuff, uh, but it gets into you know homelessness and it gets into youth programming. So we had just developed the Department of Public Safety and Community Resources. And under that department, we have the new community response team, which no one in Contra Costa County has. And, and it's 24 seven, it's a team of 11 or 12, excuse me. And then we had also just cut the ribbon for our transitional housing hotel where we're housing individuals who are experiencing homelessness. All those things combined, had those things not happened, we would be in a much different situation public safety wise than we are today. The fact of the matter is, is that it, it, the work of the community crisis response team has been invaluable, particularly particularly as we've had this shortage of police officers, because now they take on calls that the police department no longer res responds to. So I'll give you an example. A domestic dispute is now something the community crisis response team responds to. Someone talking to themselves on the street is something the community response team responds to versus the police. And so it has offloaded some work on them so that they can focus on the other more dangerous calls. And so it's been extremely helpful. The hotel, before we, we, we started doing vouchers and master leasing it, had close to 300 calls per service a year. That one hotel, that one hotel, which was a, which was a safe haven for prostitution, uh, drugs, and a host of other things, weapons, shootings, everything else, everything you can think of. Today, that hotel averages about 50 calls a year uh, to the police department. And so, and some of those calls, again, are being now directed to the community crisis response team. So it is, I'm sometimes blown away that all these things fell into place at the right time, even though it wasn't a good situation, but all these things fell at the right time uh, in order to keep supporting the police department and doing their work and that we weren't at a place where, oh my God, we couldn't. I still believe we need support from CHP, particularly around traffic and controlling these sideshows. And we still need support in relation to investigations because those two departments or those two divisions within the police department were decimated as a result of the racist text messaging scandal. And that's how we're rebuilding. So we're rebuilding public safety, not from the perspective of just police, but from the perspective of the Department of Public Safety and Community Resources. I like the community the community resource, is that a volunteer group or are they paid? No, these are, no, these are all employees. <laughs> okay. They're employees. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's modeled after, we modeled it after cahoots over in, in Oregon. 
Okay. Uh, and they call theirs the, men- the, they call it the, yeah, Cahoots, which is a mental health crisis response team. But we decided that what we didn't want to do is just focus on the mental health. We wanted to focus on a larger scale on some other quality of life issues. And so that really frees up our officers from doing things that, you know, that just shouldn't be. They are not nurses and doctors. They're not mental health specialists. They're not teachers. They're law enforcement. The word enforcement. And so enforcement can mean I'm going to yell to get compliance or I'm going to use my baton or I can use my weapon. That's enforcement. And so these other areas are key in that we don't get to a point where we need to use enforcement. Yeah, no, that's a great program. And I'll uh, link to that in the show notes. So we'll make sure we can provide more information to people about that. Sounds like you guys are going to lead in police reform. And I'm sure as you have a new chief, you'll invest in new technology as well. And hopefully new officers will come in. Right. Yeah. Follow that lead. Let's, what else should people know about Antioch? I think we've covered a lot of topics here, but what haven't I asked you yet before we head out? You ask, and I just answer. I think. Antioch, I think there are some misconceptions about Antioch, which are fascinating to me. I think there's a misconception about Section 8. Uh, I've lived in many places in our country. I, I don't even think I'd ever heard of Section 8 until I moved to Antioch. And there was such there was such vitriol towards this idea of Section 8. Now I'm like, well, what is Section 8? And, you know, it's a voucher that you get to use to, you know, subsidize your rent. And so... But it's fascinating to me how a lot of folks, and not just in Antioch, but throughout the Bay Area, have blamed challenges with Antioch on Section 8, and particularly those residents who have come here. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's fascinating to me because we, it's a county-run program, and I don't know who Section... I wouldn't know who is on a Section 8 voucher. <laughs> Yet people find it so easy to blame Section 8 on, on, on all these problems. So I, I find that fascinating. I think the economic downturn and the devastation it had on cities like Stockton, Antioch, and Vallejo brought a lot of this, you know, a lot of this misunderstanding because, it, you know, when things like this happen and then your neighborhood starts to deteriorate because of the economic collapse, you know, you want to blame somebody. <laughs> and so it's easy to blame certain people. And part of it, and then at the same time, you had this large wave of, of people of color coming to Antioch. And so then Section 8, the face of Section 8 became really Black people. And so it's been fascinating to me. And there, so that when I throw those statistics up, like the majority of Black people live in Southeast Antioch. Oh, and by the way, we're the largest concentration of folks with advanced degrees in the Bay Area. And most of us are homeowners. I... <laughs> It's been fat because you hear people say these things. Well, when you know when the black people start moving to Antioch, or when those sex when they when Antioch started to allow Section Eight, Antioch doesn't control anything related to housing in Section Eight. So it's been. I share that because I just think that there's a lot of misunderstanding about about Antioch. The crime in Antioch is concentrated in certain pockets, and I can take you exactly to where those pockets are. Yeah, uh, and it's generally in in some of the older parts of Antioch, and so, but most, the majority of people who live in Antioch, which is south of the highway, um, live in very quiet suburban communities. The housing market is fine; people continue to move here, and it's a desirable place. But some of the chatter that you hear, I think, is is just very hysterical sometimes. I could take you to, you know, Slant Ranch Shopping Plaza, a pretty great place. I can take you to a host of a host of places. I can take you to the Delta and you can have a great dinner over at Smith's Landing or at Monica's. Yeah, I have several friends who own boats. You want to go out boating? We'll take you boating. By the way, Antioch is also is the only place in the Bay Area where residents have an astronomical amount of access to public to public land. Don't forget, we have two. Two. No, no. Three now, three regional parks, three regional parks. And Antioch has a vast park system that's connected to trails. So if folks want to come to Antioch, more than happy to take you to all those great places that that we have to offer. I 
I love, I want to say, is it Black Diamond Regional Park? Black Diamond Mines. We have Contaloma. Yeah. And then we're now going to, you know, the old Roddy Ranch is now going to be a state park. So, uh, you know, we have a lot to be proud of here in the city of Antioch. And, and I, you know, people come here to ride their bikes on our trails. People don't know that. People come here to ride our trails on their bikes. So it's, there's, a, there's a lot going on in Antioch. We're not Walnut Creek. If you want, you know, to have like a, you know, a fancy, glamorous night out, go to Walnut Creek. If you enjoy the outdoors, if you enjoy biking, if you enjoy bo boating, if you enjoy hiking, we have all that for you here. And some great restaurants. That's a, that's a great passion for your city and, and telling people really what's there. And I think most people probably don't even know that. And I've been fortunate. I've been to both those parks and done hiking around. And one has a beautiful pool and there's a ton of open space in and around the the parks and you guys even have some trails that run through some of the neighborhoods as yeah. as well that i've i've gotten to walk through so really there is some beautiful areas of the city up there and i've, I've enjoyed visiting them and learning about some of the different neighborhoods so i really appreciate that Thank you for being here today and I appreciate all your time and telling us a little bit more about what's happening out there in East County. Indeed. Wait, don't leave yet. Hit subscribe. Make sure you get the weekly updates. We have a new episode every Wednesday for stuff happening in the East Bay. In the meantime, follow me on LinkedIn, Jared Ash, or check out our firm where we have a weekly newsletter and blog at Capstone Government Affairs on LinkedIn. Thanks for joining us today on the Capstone Conversation.